Hello, fellow time travellers, and welcome to the very first episode of my love letter to the British Isles. Hopefully, together. I certainly do, but hopefully you will join me on what I regard as an unforgettable journey through time and also space, because as well as the years, we, we cover a lot of ground. Uh, it, it, the story starts for me around a million years ago in the British Isles with a set of wet, soft footprints in mud on the Norfolk coast. And then gradually through the course of the podcast, we get closer and closer to the present day. Uh, and it's, the, the stories stop off at sometimes uh, expected destinations, you know, Stonehenge or Westminster Abbey or places that everyone thinks about and knows about. Other times less familiar. Uh, but at all times we're walking in the footsteps of the ancestors, trying to imagine what made them tick uh, and considering uh, the effect that the activities of the ancestors have had on the way we live today. I like to think it's got everything in it from, from the earliest hunters through the first farmers in the Stone Age, the usual suspects, kings and queens, uh, the brutality and the battles that they provoked, sometimes moments of, of individual bravery, many occasions of genius, inspiration, but all the time, blood, sweat and tears. It's, it's a million years worth of story. Um, and I, I like to think that it, 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 it touches upon all the things that I care about and all the things that move me. So to help support the making of the podcast, The Love Letter to the British Isles, uh, please sign up to my Patreon site, uh, where there's more uh, films about how history and the present day run alongside each other, you know, separated by a thin gossamer curtain. But they sometimes feel so close together, past and present. So there's history, there's current affairs, and there's my comments for what they're worth on both. Uh, I put up a new vodcast every week, um, a film here in my home in Stirling. Uh, we've by now got quite an archive, there's quite a collection of, of videos on all sorts of different subjects. It's quite, a, it's quite an eclectic mix of, of topics that we run over. Sometimes we do competitions, Paul and I. So join me at patreon.com, search for me by name, Neil Oliver. I'd love your support. Uh, and in, in any event, I'd like your company along for the ride. That's enough about why I'm doing this and what it's all about. Let's get going. Let's take that first step on our journey into the love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. The very earliest beginning of our story is of the most ephemeral, fragile, will-o'-the-wisp nature. You would think that something that was going to survive for a million years would be made of solid rock or, or something equally impermeable and, and solid and hard. But the beauty, the paradox, is that this story begins with wet footprints in mud. The first podcast in this series is the story of a chance discovery that led to a race against the elements. A glimpse of the elemental powers that shape this place. Ancient evidence pointing us towards a lost tribe. Human and yet not quite us. A landscape of fearsome beauty that brings us face to face with who we are. And our responsibilities to the world. In this series, I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me, and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver, and this is my love letter to the British Isles. My story of the British Isles, and it, I have to lay claim to it right at the top, because I'm not suggesting for a minute that it's like a conventional history. This is the story of the British Isles, as it has suggested itself to me, based on the places that I have seen with my own eyes. And all I really did was put them in chronological order. And the earliest, the first page, if you like, page one of my story of the British Isles, is at a place called Haysborough on the Norfolk coast. 
Uh, Haysborough, it, it looks more like Happisborough if you look for it on the map. H-A-P-P-I-S-B-U-R-G-H. But in that part of the world, they pronounce it Haysborough. Uh, and it, that part of the story, that beginning of my story of the British Isles, is the best part of a million years old. That's like the levelling of a mountain or the raising up of a valley. You don't really think in terms of a million years. If you were to sit and count from one to a million, one, two, three, it would take you two and a half weeks. I mean, these are big numbers. These are big numbers. But the story of the British Isles, as I understand it, starts the best part of a million years ago in Haysborough in Norfolk. What has survived that kicks off our story is a set of footprints. Not fossilised, not turned to rock, but as wet and soft as they were in the moment in which they were made. Because it's a million years, uh, the footprints in question that were found at Haysborough, they weren't even made by Homo sapiens. Our species is only maybe 200, 250,000 years old. Footprints that are a million years old have to belong to another version of humankind. And because they're of the age they are, in all likelihood they were made by people of the species known as Homo antecessor. If Homo sapiens is wise man, which we flatter ourselves with the name wise man, Homo antecessor means pioneer, the pioneer people. What happened at, if, if you're familiar with Norfolk, that part of the, of the eastern, southern eastern seaboard of, of the British Isles of England, you'll know that Norfolk, the coastline, is, is composed in the main of soft sands and sediments and muds. It's not rock. So it's very vulnerable to the action of the sea. And the coastline at Norfolk is being fiercely eroded. One big winter storm and the coastline can be eroded by many tens of metres all at one go. It's very fragile there. And the village of Haysborough is actually literally falling into the sea. It's like the fall of the House of Usher over there. Uh, if, if, when I was there, there were, there were houses teetering on the edge of the cliff in the, in the act of falling down onto the beach many tens of metres below. And you walk along a road, a tarmac road with a white dotted line up the middle, and suddenly it just ends in a vertical drop down onto the beach. And the people of Haysborough are having to move. They are moving hundreds of metres inland and starting again because it's like, it's like King Canute there. You know, they, they know that no matter what they did in terms of putting up sea defences, the sea is doing what the sea does and it can't be stopped, just as King Canute knew that. So they're moving inland. Around 2013, there was a particularly heavy storm uh, and in its aftermath, a, a, a big chunk of, of cliff had fallen like a slice of cake down onto the beach, revealing beneath it a level surface, compacted surface, that had been out of sight, that had been buried for, well, who knew how long? That was the first question. And somebody's sharp eye looked at that surface that had just been freshly revealed and saw human footprints, instantly recognised them. Archaeologists were called in and had a look and they realised that they were indeed human footprints. Now, at that time, Haysborough was not unknown to the archaeological, uh, paleontological community because some years previously, uh, there had been a find of tools, stone tools, 78 of them, tools that had been, that had been flaked, you know, that had been napped from, from pebbles to have sharp edges on them. Archaeologists had found them and they had, they had looked at the terrain where they were found and they had realised that they, they were on the, what had been the banks of a river or, or a wide river coming out into an estuary into the sea. This had been a course of the River Thames. Okay, now everyone knows where the River Thames comes out into the into the into the sea now at London. Well, in the past, the the river has taken a different path, and for the longest time, we were islands. We were a peninsula of Northwest Europe. There was a land bridge, dry land, that connected the southeast of what is England to the Low Countries and northwestern France. People walked in and out, so the, the morphology of the landscape was different, and the Thames River found its way out to the sea by a completely different route. And it, as it happens, it, it came out at Haysborough on the Norfolk coast, many, many miles north. OK? So archaeologists and geologists know when the River Thames took that path. 
And therefore, they were able to date those stone tools. They were able to say when those stone tools must have been by the River Thames. And it's between 840 and 950,000 years ago. That's how long ago the Thames took that path to the sea. So that gives us a date for those stone tools. And because subsequent to that, those footprints were found relatively close by, it connects the footprints to the stone tools and it connects all of that to that path of the River Thames. So you've got the ancient course of the River Thames and they use stratigraphy, paleomagnetism and fossil flora and fauna to date the rocks the footprints were found in? Yeah, and that means that those human footprints at Haysborough were made sometime between 840 and 950,000 years ago. Wow. And what happens is that that they're preserved because in the aftermath of the people walking across and leaving the prints, another wave comes across and it, it puts in a little layer of sediment into the footprint, a bit like making a plaster of Paris mould, a cast. So the, 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 the waves keep coming in and eventually this footprint is filled up. It's, it's filled with sediment and that protects the shape. The river changed course. Those footprints were left behind and during the course of the last... 950,000 years, let's say, they were progressively buried as sediments and other materials built up on top of them. And they would have remained hidden forever, but for the fact that the Norfolk coast is being eroded in the way it is. And uh, 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 most amazing is that after surviving for the best part of a million years, the archaeologists had to work against the clock because the, the tide was now, they were now vulnerable to the tide again for the first time in all that time. And they, they, they just Working in pouring rain and against the clock, they took photographs, they took casts of the footprints, and then the, the sea does what the sea does, and those footprints are now gone. Gone forever. Having survived for all of that time, they have now vanished. In the time that was available to the archaeologists, when they had a look, they, could, they counted about 50 prints over an area about, so about 40 square metres. And they worked out that it was just a small group of people, adults and children. So it's impossible not to imagine, you know, it's like mothers and sons, fathers and daughters, down by the what was then the course of the River Thames, just where it was going out into the sea. They would have been hunters, gatherers. They were probably down there collecting uh, seafood, mussels, uh, clams, uh, other seaweeds, anything that they could eat. Maybe they were fishing. In a wide open area like that, they might also have been able to hunt. There would have been, uh, there would have been other species there that were, that were possibly available to the hunters. But they were down there and they just made some footprints, as, as, as anyone does, walking about on soft mud. And how could they possibly have conceived of the possibility that the footprints they made that afternoon or that morning would last for the better part of a million years? But so it is. And it, it makes us confront all, so, all sorts of realities about who we are yeah. and what it means to be people living in our part of the world. For one thing, it brings us face to face with the reality that, that we are just the last and youngest species of human beings that have been here. I conceive, I, I visualise the British Isles as rented accommodation. We don't own, we don't own this place. We rent space. We're here for a little time. And in, in due course, we will vacate the premises. And underneath the floorboards, down in the basement of this rented space, are the things left behind by the other variations of humankind that came before us. The Neanderthals, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo erectus, Homo antecessor. All of those previous tenants of this rented space are still here to be found. And it's so important to control our vanity about how special we seem to think that we are. It's so important to be reminded that other versions of humankind were here long before us. We've only been here for 200, 250,000 years. Homo antecessor walked out of Africa two million years ago. And they were abroad in the wider world for hundreds of thousands of years. They finally became extinct around 800,000 years ago. So they lasted for a very, very long time. And they were in our part of the world just as they were in every part of the older world. And it's important to confront the reality that we are just passing through. We haven't even been here for very long. 
and the, and the marks that we are making on the landscape are just the latest. And in a thousand years' time or in a million years' time, it'll all be different and it'll be populated by somebody else again. And for me, when I go to page one of my story, to Haysborough, and you stand and you look out at the sea, or you stand on the, on the cliff there and you see the, the truncated roads that drop down onto the beach or the, or the wreckage of houses that have fallen down onto the beach, and what you're made to confront is the reality that we are not a finished piece. We are a work in progress. The British Isles are being sculpted moment by moment by every wave that breaks, and the shape is constantly being redrawn. And that map that everyone carries in their head of what the British Isles looks like doesn't exist, not in any absolute sense. It's an approximation. Every moment it's being modified. And you go to a place like Haysborough and you're reminded that it's changing every moment. And once enough time has gone by, it will be very, very different. So Britain's in a constant process of revealing its historical secrets, which sometimes we miss, but others... Like with these footprints, we find. Uh, yes, it's by chance. It, by ch- just someone eagle-eyed spotted them in the aftermath of the storm and thought, a minute, that's footprints. <laughs> I've, I, I've seen other footprints in other places. I mean, this is a, the, the chance survival of footprints in this way. It happens all the time. I mean, there will have been footprints made on a beach or a riverbank yesterday that by chance will be preserved in the same way. And they will, maybe they'll be found. In all likelihood, they won't be. A few years ago, I visited a place in South Wales, not far from Swansea, yeah. a place called Goldcliff. And I, I'd been invited there by archaeologists who were aware that, depending on the tides, sometimes human footprints were revealed in the mud there. In the, in the, in the space between the high tide and the low tide, every now and again they would see footprints. And I went out and, and spent a day with, with the team uh, when the conditions were right, and they were recording some more footprints. The, the footprints at Goldcliff were made by Mesolithic hunters around 8,000 years ago. Eight, 9,000 years ago, very hard to put a date on them. And I, I cannot tell you what it, what it feels like to look at them, to touch them. You know, the, uh, to, to put your hand down on soft mud that, that has on it the impression of a human foot and, and, and to know that your skin is touching sand that 8,000 or 9,000 years ago was touched by the sole of another human being's foot. There's a strange sensation of making a connection. And, and it was also, it's also a feeling that's a bit like intruding on a private conversation that you weren't meant to hear and seeing where they were and knowing what they were doing. And especially for people, the people living 8,000 years ago or 950,000 years ago, you know, we're kind of preoccupied with the idea of being seen we're, we're, we're very, you know, about on screens and FaceTime and Skype and Zoom and it's all about being seen and putting our little films on YouTube and look at me, look at me. We've got, we've got very much, many of us have an attitude about wanting to be watched. Well, it wasn't always like that. And for the hunters and gatherers, they, yes, they were predators and they were, they were able to hunt and, and to kill, but they were also vulnerable. And the, and the success of their hunting operations and their very survival probably depended upon being hidden. These weren't people that exposed themselves to the light. These were people who were careful. Concealment would have been a big part of what they did. And that, that, that knowledge that these were people who lived subtle, uh, hidden lives, to intrude upon them and find their trail after 8,000 years, that added to the sensation of, maybe I shouldn't have seen this. For me, it's, it's so profound that while you would think that after thousands or hundreds of thousands of years, the only things that would survive would be made of rock or iron or whatever, something hard. It, to find that some of the earliest evidence of, of, our, of our ancestors is in the form of soft footprints in mud. It's almost like a biblical parable. If you, you ask yourself, ask yourself, you know, what, what will be discovered of you in a hundred thousand years time? And I'm not talking about anything deliberate, like a film you've made, or a a diary you've kept, or a letter that you wrote. These are deliberate things. What I mean, what casual act have you left behind in the landscape? A footprint, a a dropped pen knife, 
a, a, a loss, a, 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 an initials scratched into a wall. You know, what, what will be discovered of you in a hundred thousand years? And what tiny ephemeral trace will someone be invited to look at in a hundred thousand years time and wonder about you? And that might be the only proof of your existence. The only proof that you were ever alive at all might boil down to a wet footprint on a riverbank that you made while walking with your girlfriend or boyfriend and thought no more about it. And that might be the proof of your life. It could be something so throwaway. You don't know what will be. You know, that, that, that family down by the River Thames 950,000 years ago looking for some food couldn't possibly have known that they were that they were leaving behind proof of their passing. They couldn't have known that. And, and likewise, you know, we go through our lives now maybe thinking that we're doing certain things that will make a difference and that will be remembered. And maybe they will. Maybe you'll write a best-selling novel or, or maybe you'll, you know, be the architect of a building that, that stands for a, a thousand years. Maybe. But at the same time and unconsciously, we're also making uncountable little actions every moment of every day. And there's always the possibility that it's that that will be found. That, that casual throwaway comment or that footprint in the sand is what will be found. And you've almost got to think, you should be careful. You should be careful about everything you do because anything of that collection of moments might be what's found in the future. You know, you might as well make good marks, not clumsy bad ones. And you'd want them to find something good. <laughs> you'd want them to find something worthwhile. So there's, there's something, I think that it, it, even from the distant past, even from a million years ago or, or the best part thereof, there's a message, a, a, a warning. You know, pay attention and don't think that, you know, that, that you get away with anything <laughs> because anything and everything might be found and that might be the testimony as to your existence. So you better make it something that counts. Although it's strangely touching that instead of the books and the TV programmes you've made, it might be a walk with your dog and family that will be discovered. Yeah, well, you know, who knows? Who knows? But yes, that is what you're finding there. Is, it's the survival of the everyday. It's not a momentous occurrence. What survived was just the kind of thing that people do all the time. You know, families go out together to find something to eat. Now, people are doing that in the 21st century. And lo and behold, a million years ago, a family went out to find something to eat. You know, that, that element of our, of our shared experience, it connects us. You know, it reminds us about some of the constants about what it is to be human and alive. And, and it's not even our own species. It, it's not, it's people, that, that image that everyone has seen, it's called the ascent of man, where there's the, the upright modern person with a spear walking at the front of the line walking towards the right and progressively down the line towards the left are more and more primitive versions until eventually you get to the back of the queue and it's a knuckle-dragging ape. <laughs> and and, the, and the, the implication all the time is it's as though Mother Nature had us in mind all along and was, was gradually working towards us, you know, as if we were the objective. But it, it's not like that. What we've come to realise by these chance encounters like with Homo antecessor, is that we have much more shared humanity than we used to allow for. You know, we used to dismiss everybody that had gone before as like quasimodos, us but not quite us, and not as good. That was always the implication. Neanderthal man, yeah, caveman with his heavy brow ridges and he's, you know, a bit lumpen, a bit brutish. But the more we learn about, about Neanderthals, the more we realise that we have so much in common with them uh, and it's a it's a it's a humbling uh, experience to see that we're we're just we're the only survivors. We have the planet to ourselves now. We're the only version of humankind left, Homo sapiens. But there was a time a hundred thousand years ago when we shared the place with others, with the Neanderthals, uh, and with other variations of the human species. There might have been as many as a dozen alive and abroad on the planet at one time, uh, and for whatever reason through actions of our own or just the, the mindless processes of evolution, we've ended up as sole tenants. But it wasn't always this way. Have we ever found remains from antecessor in this country? Not in this country. In 2008, 
at a place called Atapuerca in Spain, human remains were found and analysis showed that they were Homo antecessor, in excess of a million years old. Uh, Homo antecessor as a species has existed from about two million years ago and and lasted for more than a million years and then eventually became extinct around 800,000 years ago. We have not found any remains of Homo antecessor in the British Isles. What was found at Haysborough uh, were footprints uh, and tools. So that's, that's forensic evidence, if you like, of those people, but not the remains of the people themselves. Uh, the oldest human being, if you like, uh, is Boxgrove Man, uh, which is the name given to uh, two pieces of the same broken shin bone and some teeth, a couple of teeth, uh, that were found in a, a gravel quarry in West Sussex at a place called Boxgrove. Uh, and they were found in association with uh, stone tools and butchered animal bones. And they're known as Boxgrove Man, uh, but there's, there's no way that we were able to tell the sex, the gender, from one broken bone and two teeth. So it could be Boxgrove Woman. Uh, but the, this, the, the mass of the bone suggests someone robust, Estimates are of somebody heavily muscled, maybe weighing around this 14 stone, 90 kilograms, quite big, quite powerfully built. The teeth uh, have uh, scratch marks, scores in them. And the, the assessment, the interpretation there is that the person was in the habit of holding meat, clamped in their teeth, and then sawing at it with a, with a blade, a stone blade, cutting it off, and then chewing and swallowing. And from time to time, made you know, accidental scores into the enamel. Now, Boxgrove Man has been dated to 500,000 years ago. Half a million years old. And he's another variation again. He's a a variation of humankind called Homo heidelbergensis. So-called because the first remains that look like this were found near the the city of Heidelberg in Germany. And so so the species is called Homo heidelbergensis. Neanderthal is that, the Neander Valley in Germany was where the first example of the Neanders, the Neanderthals were found in the Neander Valley, but Homo Heidelbergensis. And this uh, individual that we know as Boxgrove Man, half a million years ago, was making stone tools, because we find the stone tools, hand axes, and nearby are the butchered bones of woolly rhinoceros and bears. (laughs) So... Either they were hunting those animals and killing them and butchering them, or perhaps they were just coming across, you know, the the carcasses and and scavenging like hyenas, just going after the the meat that they could get from animals that had died of some other causes. But again, there's another reminder of another experiment with the nature of being human in our part of the world, in what is now West Sussex. But that individual and his, his people shared a version of Britain that was populated by rhinos and bears and lions and other creatures that we associate with Africa or or elsewhere. So that you're constantly being reminded here in the British Isles that our part of the world has been many different places for many different kinds of people. For a long time it was a peninsula of Europe, not a set of islands. It's had different climates. It's been warmer. It's been wetter. It's been drier. It's been colder. At the time of the footprints in Haysborough, 950,000 years ago, uh, the the evidence from the the geology suggests that the climate was dipping down towards an ice age. For the last three million years, the Northern Hemisphere has has experienced ice ages, one after the other. Uh, They last for, you know, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years, and then the temperature goes up again, and there's a, a warm period, and then it's inevitably followed by another ice age. We're overdue an ice age now. This, this, this warm period that we're living through uh, has lasted longer than we might expect. But in any event, another ice age will surely come eventually, because that has been the way of things for the last three million years. So at the time when that little family yeah. were, were scavenging for food by the banks of the River Thames 950,000 years ago, the climate was dipping. It was probably a bit like modern Scandinavia. With, uh, with short, warm summers and long, cold, dark winters. And thousands of years later on, the conditions would have become fully an ice age and all of the people and all of the animals would have been pushed out 
and we'd have headed south again and the, and the landscape would have been empty and, and underneath ice half a mile thick. Uh, but but and Homo antecessor and those footprints are also a snapshot of a time when a species of human being was being confronted by the reality of a coming ice age. What did Britain look like 950,000 years ago? We have only been uh, an, an archipelago, a group of islands, for a relatively short space of time, only for the past 8,000 years. Up until that point, we were always a peninsula of Northwest Europe. You know, we were just a peninsula of dry land sticking out into the, the North Sea, or the Atlantic Ocean. And people would have simply walked into our part of the world. There would have been no need for boats. There was a wide, vast land bridge between the sort of south and east of what is now England and the, the low countries, Holland and, and towards northern, western France. There was a whole bridge of land. So we weren't the British Isles. If you, if you wanted to call it anything, you'd have to call it the British Peninsula. Because we were, we were part of mainland Europe at that point. Uh, and at the time of Homo antecessor, the, the climate was deteriorating, as we would say it, as we would describe it. It was getting colder. Uh, and, the, and the people there were they were still able to survive. They were still. It would have made sense to them to be by a river, uh, and indeed by the sea, uh, because th those are good sources of food. There's fish. There are seals. Uh, there are all sorts of creatures that, that that come down onto the water side and and down onto the seaside. There are shells. There are crabs. There are birds. There's eggs. There's things that you can collect. And and furthermore, the the interior it was probably quite wooded. Uh, maybe morass and bogs and marsh and it might have been easier to move around the outside following the coastline and where there was a river which would also, the river banks would have let you penetrate inland so small bands of hunter-gatherers would have tended to exploit that kind of area, a river or the coast because they would have been ready sources of food and, and other useful materials So that, that process of of the, of the accidental, by chance, preservation of footprints is as old as the human species. It's been happening for as long as apes have been walking upright on two legs. They have been leaving footprints and some of those footprints have always survived. The footprints at Haysborough are the start. How did you choose the rest of the places on your journey? If I closed my eyes, I could see them. It, they were like the lights that stayed on. Well, well, so it is with these places. These hundred places are the ones that to me seem to matter. And so I've, I've put them together in order from oldest to youngest. And to me, they tell a story that makes sense. A man on a mission, descending perilously steep cliffs, braving jagged rocks and pounding waves below, comes face to face with a world-changing discovery. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles. You can follow in my footsteps as my journey unfolds across these isles of ours. Go to the website to see the places I've chosen and let me know the locations that inspire you. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Neil Oliver and Paul Ratcliffe for Fat Belly Films. Music by Malcolm Goldie. Additional research by Oscar, Evie, Lucian, Teddy and Archie. Finance, Catherine and Trudy. Post-production, Althorpe Studios. Photography by Neil R. Graphics, Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. An FBF Podcasts production.